I am now to have our last uh, keynote session uh, where uh, Tom Kaflin, uh, VP of IEEE Consumer Electronics Society Factor Directions Committee, will uh, face uh, a very nice talk about a Moore's Law for Mobile Power. I think Tom doesn't need uh, more presentations because he's very well known for all of us. So it's time to enjoy Tom's talk. Tom, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Hello, friends and colleagues, and good afternoon. So um, the last uh, few years I've been involved with the IEEE Future Directions Committee. Big IEEE has its Future Directions Committee. But also within the Consumer Electronics Society, we've got some activities we've got going on in Future Directions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the, the directions, the Future Directions Committee. And then I'll get into the thing that uh, I want to focus on here, which is the idea of creating initiative for mobile power, uh, which could be very enabling for folks. So uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, power in our hands, sources of power, safety and sustainability considerations, manufacturing, mobile power devices, and we'll get into this actual safe mobile power initiative itself. But first of all, let's talk a bit about what we've been doing in the Consumer Electronics Society with regard to future directions of technology that can impact consumer electronics. And our objectives are to help bring interesting and important topics to Consumer Electronics Society conferences, workshops, and other events. To help generate articles for the Consumer Electronics Magazine and a bunch of you, I think there's probably still a few lying around here. Um, to create new initiatives on important topics in consumer electronics and create a bigger and lasting impression, uh, lasting presence rather, of the Consumer Electronics Society in the IEEE overall. IEEE, of course, is the largest technical organization in the world with over 430,000 members worldwide. And the last one is to help create the future because we're all gonna live in it. And uh, I think many of us, including me, are probably inspired by science fiction in terms of getting into technology in the first place. So we'd like to make the stuff we used to read about. So let's talk a bit about some of the stuff we've been doing. Uh, conferences, um, uh, we have an Internet of Things uh, working group, and actually, uh, Asumi over here, Donna Kanta, is, uh, has been really uh, helping to spearhead that work, but there's been a lot of other people involved too. So we're organizing articles and conference sessions. Um, there's uh, uh, consumer home health was a topic that was covered in some detail yesterday by Stefan and Nahum. And uh, the Sustainable Electronics Committee organized a tutorial session and participated in a Region 6, which is where I'm from, uh, Sustainable Technology Conference uh, in July of this year. And we've begun to work on another uh, IEEE Future Directions Convergence event, um, which is associated with the 2015 ICCE in Las Vegas um, with the broader IEEE Future Directions Committee. And uh, last year we had one of these where we had people from a lot of different uh, societies on a lot of different disciplines talk about uh, to, give, uh, to give presentations at the ICCE in Las Vegas um, on, on various topics that be of interest to consumer electronics. Now let's talk a little bit in particular on the future directions on Internet of Things. We want to encourage development of a consumer-centric Internet of Things, directly related to the creation of an ecosystem where we consider the consumers at the core. And so we're looking at uh, the aspects of the sensor networks of things that are somehow uh, connected together, and uh, they might be um, directly interacting through the Internet, they might interact with something locally and then, and then interact with the Internet. But uh, all these things which are developing because of our ability to build smaller and smaller microelectronics, embed them in more things like the, the folks that have the idea of putting it clothing who were here yesterday, and then be able to make it so these things can also uh, uh, have, have uh, a capability of communicating with each other. So we're organizing a special session on consumer-centric uh, Internet of Things at the 2014 GCCE conference in Japan next month. We have six papers in the session. We're also, there's a call for articles for the Consumer Electronics Magazine on the Consumer Internet of Things with the deadline of September 21st of this uh, year. So if anyone uh, would like to contribute to that, we've already got some things planned, but uh, if anyone else has something uh, coming up pretty soon here, so let us know. We also uh, would like to organize a panel discussion for the ICCE 2015 in Las Vegas on, uh, on this Consumer Internet of Things if we can. In the magazine, there's a call for articles for the special issue uh, which is the January issue uh, focused on uh, consumer Internet of Things. There will be an article on, also on the thing I'm going to talk about more here, 
uh, the safe advanced mobile power activities. Uh, we're continuing to promote and identify potential authors and topics related uh, to the future of consumer electronics and their travels and doing things like what I'm doing right now and talking to you. So uh, we've also, another thing we did last year, and actually it's still open, is uh, a survey of young consumers on consumer electronic trends. And uh, we actually we got an article published in, I think it was probably the April magazine, on the results of that uh, to date. Uh, this is just an example of what that looked like. Um, asking, uh, you know, different uh, demographics of how old the people were, what sort of devices they had, um, how much time they spent using these devices, for instance, and uh, uh, I'm, of course, a storage guy, so I, we had some questions there related to storage. Do they back stuff up? And about 20% said they don't back their stuff up, which is not a good idea, by the way. So with that, I want to talk to you a bit about um, a particular thing we've been working on. I think it's very, very interesting. has a lot of potential. Um, this, of course, is a picture or image of Nikolai Tesla, who, had the idea, who, who thought he had a technique for... Uh, uh, for uh, transmitting power wirelessly. And I know that he was a Serbian originally, if I remember right, and there's, of course, a bunch of Serbians around here. And uh, with more energy in mobile devices, however we get it there, we can use those devices without recharging for a longer period of time. And that's convenient if you don't have reliable power. But if you have very little power or intermittent access to power, this could be even more enabling. So there's both humanitarian and, um, and also convenience capabilities that involve being able to do this. Um, so we can do more with our mobile devices as well. Yep. And um, in fact, if we think about this, our electronic devices are the source of our personal power. The things we carry with us, especially as they become intelligent, as they become uh, electronic devices, um, will allow us to do more things. So we always try to do more with the technology that we carry with us. There's never enough power or capability that we can build into these things. And we'll always need, in order to be able to use this, no matter what we do, we'll always, of course, need to be clever in our use of power, and uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, both because we never have enough power, but also to control, and for a design aspect, to control the thermal load, especially with processors running. Okay, you can actually get these things so very hot that they, uh, that they could actually be a, a problem with burning yourself or of the circuits destroying themselves. So the particular thing we're, we're, we're focusing on in this initiative is the idea of trying to make enabling power in a, uh, in a mobile phone, in a, in a, in a smartphone, and uh, to try to enable that, uh, keeping power in that thing for a longer period of time, basically a week without recharging from proximity to a fixed power source. Mobile phones have been in active use since the 1980s. It used to be about the size of a, of a brick, and they've come down a lot in size. And There's new ones being introduced, like yesterday with the, uh, with the iPhone. Their characteristics are pretty well understood. They're a good test bed, therefore, for technology development. And the technology built into a phone can translate into other mobile devices, the new watches, eventually into clothing, um, but also devices that we use every day, such as cars. And especially the battery technology with the electric cars, which is another IEEE initiative. Now, let's take a look at some of the, some of the uh, phone uh, energy characteristics. And I'm sorry, I don't have a good laser pointer here. I forgot to bring mine. But here's some examples of a few different products. This is from the white paper we're working on. Um, uh, of some different uh, uh, phones you can see here. And uh, we can see uh, just up next to the right of the product name, there's a manufacturer stated standby power, which tends to be large numbers. They reported run time, which tends, run time, which tends to be uh, large numbers. And then the actual run time tends to be uh, considerably less, roughly half of what the manufacturers say it is for, for a lot of people's uses. And uh, the kind of batteries, lithium iron is, lithium ion batteries are the most common right now. Um, with probably an average uh, uh, power total, uh, total energy available of uh, 1,200 milliamp hours. Um, there's one down at the bottom which has, just has a bigger battery and actually has about 3,400 uh, 3, milliamp hours. Of course, that would be a larger battery, way more, and all those things as well. If we try to get some calculation of uh, what the usage might be for, uh, for a couple different uh, types of users of mobile phones, let's think of a casual cell phone user. They might get five hours of active use with the 1,400 milliamp hour, 1.5 amp hour battery. If that was consistent across seven days, then the total energy requirement would be seven times that, and about, therefore about 9.8 amp hours. So if this is a 3.7 volt device, the actual energy use in a week is about 9.8 amp hours times 3.7, or 36.3 watt hours, or 130,536 joules. 
So that's the kind of energy you'd need for, need for ca the casual user. And if you had a more active user, more of a power user of a cell phone, they might want 12 hours of intense use with lots of radios running. They might have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, the, the near-field communication, especially with some of these new phones. They might be downloading a lot of data and maybe even watching some movies um, or video of some kind. This user may consume uh, 1,400 milliamp hours in only three hours and actually want to consume four times that, that power, that amount of power during the day, which is 5.6 amp hours. The laser pointer. Thank you, sir. There it is. I can almost see it. If, the, if that was a 3.7 uh, volt device, the energy required then for one day would be uh, 5.6 times 3.7 or 20.7 watt hours. And if you did that over seven days, now you're 145 watt hours or 522,144 joules. So um, that's a lot more power than our current batteries have. But if we, had, if we had more power, there's a lot of stuff we can do besides just be able to do the things we do today. Okay? Um, we could run radios more often, GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, near field. We could have microprojectors in phones. There actually is uh, technology out there where I can have a microprojector that could, that could uh, actually play out high-definition video from my phone that could fit inside the phone. But, whoops. What do I do? Is that it? There it is. That actually could fit in, could fit in the phone, but uh, because it would chew up your battery so fast, people, uh, most people don't use it. We could run cameras all the time with multiple pictures per image. Another laser pointer. Uh, so why is that important? Because, and I think some other people have talked about this earlier, because we're going to record our lives as they happen. Okay? In fact, ah! Go away. Okay. My kids text their friends all the time. They send pictures to each other. Uh, they watch YouTube videos. They, it's only a matter of time before people will want to do this constantly. You know, I mean, they have to find ways in order to organize this stuff and be able to use it. But the desire is there. And if, if this starts to happen, just the raw content, you may not save it all, but the raw content you could generate could be petabytes of personal content within, the, within not too long a period of time. And there's already devices out there. In fact, uh, I think it was a couple days ago during the conference, we were talking about uh, some of the ideas of people recording things. And there's been some papers on this topic. There are commercial devices out there, and there's been people have been playing with this stuff in all kinds of weird fashions for quite some time. Uh, there's a book by Gordon Bell and Jim Gemmell, uh, basically on uh, Total Recall, uh, which is about uh, building life log type devices. You can buy spy pens. Um, that you can put in your pocket, or you can buy lanyard-based things you can wear, wear that can record stuff as it happens, it, either still pictures or video. And if you were to take, um, with, with reasonable assumptions for, the, for a person's waking time uh, for five years, and uh, they start recording in year, in year one here, uh, just the raw content generated could achieve pretty large uh, capacity just for one person doing a life log um, over the course of five years' time. So this is, uh, you know, the, the kind of requirements to do this and there, therefore the power to be able to run those cameras to be able to make this stuff is fairly considerable. But again, it will uh, create new types of metadata and information and probably the ability with the right kind of analytical tools um, and uh, storage and organization of information to create prosthetic memory devices that can help us remember things, like where we put something or who we're meeting if we haven't seen them for 10 years. Um, other things we could do. Uh, we could provide wireless energy for batteryless uh, wireless devices. It would take that you, your, it would borrow your electromagnetic energy in order to power the device to do something for you. That's what RFID tags do. But you could do other things as well. Mobile phones could be the basis of edge networks for the Internet of Things. In other words, I could be accessing these uh, these devices. It essentially this could be like a lo local hub for all the different stuff I've got working with me, and then it might communicate as I want it to um, with the general Internet. Phone could, could also power external USB devices. Essentially, if it had enough juice, it itself could be a power source for other things. Um, you know, for instance, uh, medical device of some kind. Uh, and that might be important, especially if you're in, uh, in places where they don't have a lot of power and you want to have a, a portable medical device with you that works on your phone. Phones could be more useful for untethered Wi-Fi hotspots if they had more power because, because uh, radios chew up batteries. 
With more power, phones could have more powerful computers and do more complex computations, like the HEVC decoding, for example, um, and uh, do various sorts of computational imaging calculations. And we could probably do things we haven't even thought of yet, once we have the ability to do it and people start working with it. So what are the potential sources of power to enable us to bring all of these interesting possibilities to, uh, to fruition? Let's take a look at the sources of power, and it's uh, different than what uh, Genghis Khan had. Um, ours are energy storage, for instance, batteries, energy generation, example might be fuel cells, energy harvesting could be motion heat, electromagnetics, or a possibility of uh, wireless power of some sort, and there are people working on all these different things. So this is an example of what the basic, a basic battery looks like. Um, you know, it's basically a can that uh, contains uh, chemical materials that allow you to uh, store and then later retrieve electrical energy. And this is one example of an energy storage device. If there are possibilities like creating flywheels or things of that sort as well, um, that might be a possibility. Um, battery technology uh, does not uh, increase very fast. Um, but this is a looking at, uh, and this actually was for the purpose of electric vehicles, but looking at the developments of, uh, of uh, especially these lithium-based uh, battery technologies. And you can see that, uh, you know, you're getting some advances over time, but it's relatively slow. In fact, uh, uh, the generally battery technology has roughly doubled in milliamp hour available about every 10 years. Okay. And, uh, and that's a lot slower than a lot of other things, such as uh, transistor capacities or you know, number of transistors per chip, networking speeds and capabilities, and storage capacities. And it's, it's especially slower than Moore's law for semiconductors, which relates to the number of, of uh, transistor cells that can be put on a device. Uh, also, network speed growth and storage capacity. This rate of growth, the energy density required to run a phone for a week um, uh, will take decades to develop. And that's not even including these extra things you want to do. It's just including the things we're doing now, but doing them for longer during the day without recharging. Let's, here's a, another possibility, uh, energy generation. In particular, uh, the possibilities there are fuel cells. Um, and uh, there have actually been people who've made and demonstrated, say, at the CES show, uh, fuel cell-powered uh, powered phones. And there are also interesting things, such as in our first workshop that we had on the subject uh, in July in San Jose, uh, a lady from BIC, they make pens, but they also like to make other things that are disposable, like maybe a fuel cell cartridge, uh, was, was talking to us a bit about the fuel cell technology and some of the stuff they're doing. So, um, and apparently so, the travel regulations uh, with fuel cells now allows them on planes to be taken, including uh, extra cartridges. There was some concern at one point, but they've actually been qualified now to do that. Energy harvesting is another approach. Another approach uh, which uh, can use uh, micro and nano machine technologies, which could create electrical power from ambient energy of either motion, heat, electromagnetic, or other sources. Here's kind of a silly example. This actually was using microfiber uh, characteristics of these genes as you moved about to be generate electricity, and then there was a pocket here where, where the electricity would be used to charge your phone. Again, it's kind of a silly example, but I thought it was interesting. But potentially, you could be using walking on your shoes or moving in your clothing as a means of generating power for different applications. And then finally, the other thing I talked about is, is, is an emerging area of wireless power, transmission of power without wires, basically the dream of Nikolai Tesla. Uh, companies such as Whitricity are working on uh, uh, ways to transmit useful power over fairly significant distances, and there are other people working on some other ideas of doing this. There's, there's, of course, the inductive charging that people are doing now, and it's now being built into devices. This is something that could maybe even work over somewhat larger distances. So these are all the different possibilities and things that could be done. Some of these may be possible, may be workable, some of them may not be. But to power our, lead, our lives, what we need is something like uh, a Moore's Law for mobile power. We need to get more juice, be able to get more juice and use more juice in these devices than we've been able to to date. And uh, we also need it to be safe and sustainable. So increasing the energy stored in a phone could make it more dangerous. Basically, you're putting a lot of energy in a small space. And if that were, ex uh, ex if that were expended into, into the circuitry at one time, it could melt it, it could cause damage, or even hurt you. Thus, the power source must have a foolproof way to prevent massive power draws. And the energy source must not cause other hazards to the user. Um, and safety that is, of course, the key to a consumer electronic device. 
Um, it must not also emit radiations that exceed safety and interference uh, specifications. And the mobile device or its parts must not cause cutting, rubbing, or other injuries um, in ways in which it could hurt people. And uh, an interesting thing about this, this is a slide from Qualcomm, actually, where they're showing uh, the uh, potential energy densities you can get depending upon uh, in the temperatures you can get in, in, in microprocessors running inside of phones, um, under, uh, you know, uh, depending upon the areas and that sort of thing. So it's uh, getting things from, get, from getting too hot and conserving energy and managing the thermal loads, things like that, are also important characteristics in building these devices, especially building safe devices. And then finally, sustainability. The mobile phone power source should last at least three years under normal charging use. Even for those power users, it should uh, be easy to replace so the phone can be repaired or repurposed for a secondary market for another life. The phone should not contain any endangering substances that can pollute the environment. The materials used in the phone should be obtained without endangering human rights. So it also must be manufacturable. If we take a look here at uh, uh, some calculations of a tablet and smartphone bill of materials, uh, here's the, uh, the bill of materials for the batteries here. So in this particular analysis, they said it was uh, about $5.50 or about $20 for the battery in, in the smartphone or a, uh, or a tablet, for example. And we must be able to, design, to invent something, um, to be able to build it in pilot and then to ramp it up. Uh, it's got to be manufacturable at costs, at those kind of costs that, that we can afford to put in our consumer devices. And there's a lot of elements in, the, in of course, the finished product total cost includes components, but also includes the manufacturing assembly costs, and then the overhead to run the organization to, make, to actually make these products. But if, you, if you're building things by modern manufacturing technologies, you should be able to, as your volume goes up, you should be able to get a consequent reduction in your variable and your fixed costs and therefore be able to, uh, to make that, here we're saying, if we can get down to a 20, uh, total $20 cost at the end. You might start off with something that's much more expensive, but it's, you have to have the means to be able to make this so it's manufacturable. So um, we've got these, uh, so the goal here is to, is to make a power source costing less than $20 and 100 million plus production volume. Uh, it should have a useful life of at least two or three years, as we mentioned earlier. It should be repairable, making it capable of longer life and, and thus more sustainable. So that's leading us to um, the effort that we've kicked off uh, that actually is, is uh, we're work doing some workshops and activities on this. It's funded both by the IEEE Consumer Electronics Society. So thank you, Stefan. And also the, uh, the Future Directions uh, Committee of the IEEE, which we're calling the Safe Advanced Mobile Power Initiative. And our objective is to create and this is, by the way, not just the Consumer Electronics Society, but we also have other societies we invite, uh, and in, in some of whom are currently participating, including people associated with uh, electrical power uh, societies and, and uh, also the uh, uh, product safety, uh, product safety uh, uh, engineering society. So the objective is to create a safe, sustainable mobile energy source for mobile device, like a smartphone, that can supply weeks worth of normal power without recharging from proximity to a fixed power source. The creation of these longer lasting energy sources for mobile devices can have important technical and social benefits. And in order to do this, we're, we're basically saying we need, to, we need to speed up the development of energy sources for these devices. So the plans for this initiative is right. What we're uh, doing this year is we're completing a white paper, defining the problem, discussing safety and sustainability aspects, outlining uh, allowable solutions, which we went through before, and discuss the business feasibility aspects. And we have a version one of this document that's released, and we should be able to get it on our website so shortly. We're conducting two workshops, one of which we did in San Jose in July. The next one actually will be in Limerick, Ireland in, uh, in, early, in uh, early December is the plan. Sorry, Galway, Ireland, uh, in early, early December. So it's going to be not too far away from here. And we would welcome, in fact, uh, anybody who has an interest or some expertise in this area to come join us. We're looking for a total of maybe something like 15 to 20 people for this workshop. This is, you know, basically people talking, uh, experts in, in these various areas interacting with each other. Uh, this is uh, the sort of an outline of things we did in uh, July in San Jose and talking about these different, different uh, aspects. And like I say, that next workshop, uh, first week in December in Galway, Ireland, working with uh, Peter Cochran, who's also involved with the Consumer Electronics Society, uh, to organize a one-day workshop on safe, advanced mobile power. And uh, we're bringing some folks from the U.S. to come to this thing. But again, we'd like to have folks from Region 6, which includes Europe, to, to join us in there. So would you like to participate? If so, let me know. 
So let's look quickly at what we're looking here. We've got a definition of the problem. It's going to include package size, power draw characteristics, typical use and applications, total energy needed for a week, weight operating and non-operating conditions, shock and vibration, product useful life, and other consumer use considerations. And the idea here we had, uh, potentially, is that we could create something that's like uh, an XPRIZE or at least uh, be involved in talking about something that could create an initiative and a means for encouraging people to help develop the, this kind of capability. In fact, in our first workshop, we had somebody from the XPRIZE Foundation who joined us, and they apparently are working on things that are related to what we've been talking about here. So again, this is summarizing one week's power requirements for the casual cell user, maybe um, 36.3 watt hours, uh, basically 26 times typical energy in cell phone batteries, for the power cell phone user, it might end up being something like 104 times the typical energy in a cell phone battery to get that week's worth of usage. So to do that, if we're going to do that in less than 50 years, we've got to do something very different than what we're doing today. Um, again, I talked about this before, so I won't go that again. But allowable solutions, longer life, higher energy batteries, power storage devices, other energy storage devices, energy harvesting, I mean energy generation technologies, energy harvesting, wireless power that doesn't require keeping the mobile device in close proximity to the power source. Any other means for providing energy to the mobile device doesn't require attachment or proximity uh, to a fixed location energy source. And uh, again, I showed this on the feasibility, of the product feasibility before. Um, and so finally, some conclusions just to wrap up here is that our, what we've been doing various things at Consumer Electronics Society, uh, future directions. We have a lot of different things we can do. Um, and I think you know, the future of, of uh, consumer technology uh, depends an awful lot of what people such as us in this room are doing. And uh, if you have interest in some areas besides the Internet of Things or uh, 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 life science applications of consumer electronics or this power initiative, let us know about that because we can get some other things going on if we have the people and manpower and energy to do them. But there is a great need for additional power for mobile consumer devices to meet our needs. There's a number of options we went through on how we might be able to do this and perhaps do this in a sustainable uh, and safe way. And so we created this initiative uh, this, this year to help define this ba the basic issue and uh, see if we can be a goad towards, uh, towards making, uh, making things happen to develop these energy sources. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>